Hello, my name is Lionel Bovier, for the few people who I don't know in this audience. Um, and he's Scott King. We have a couple of minutes where we wanted to basically start with showing Scott's work, or uh, some works that uh, is more media related than others. And let's say you most likely here know a little bit of his work, is what you could call a double agent, uh, circulating between art and design since the 1990s. And as a other graphic designers before him, of course, he felt the need to interrogate the specifics of his practice, meaning commissioning, being commissioned for something, um, having a certain say on the message you need to communicate as a designer, having a certain relationship with graphic forms in general and the way they relate to certain modernity. Um, but what, what he did is kind of basically hijack these means more and more to develop his own practice. And I was fortunate enough to be the publisher of this beautiful book that is the first dedicated to this work, so showing a little bit how he went through uh, becoming an art director for magazines to basically using these magazines or the magazine form as a vehicle for his own work. And that's what he's going to present you with. Hello, everybody. Am I on? I'm turned on. Um, yes, yeah, so as Leonel said, for the, for the six people who don't know me well, um, I was just going to show you a very sort of, uh, that's kind of uh, a slither or a strand of, uh, I think because my head's so big, this thing's um, <laughs> quite, I might have to hold it. I might, I might have to hold it. Oh, it's better. I feel like Johnny Rotten. That's good. <laughs> uh, so, as I was saying, I was just going to show you kind of a, a, a kind of small aspect of what I do, which is kind of essentially related to media things and using the media. I study graphic design, not fine art, and I went to college in Hull, which is in a small city in the north of England, before the internet. So it was very hard to find out things, find out you know what might inspire you, and you know the library was limited and things like that. But one thing that I saw, which um, to this day is, I think is a huge influence, was this particular piece of work called Figurative by Dan Graham which, for those of you that don't know, is basically just a tour receipt running advertising space that he bought in Harper's Bazaar in 1968. And it struck me as being like almost a perfect work of art because with graphic design, I didn't know why I was doing it. I mean, everybody in my year copied things out of books and uh, trying to make trendy graphic design, and I just didn't want to do that. And this, because it was kind of within the media, yet a critique of the media, and I guess also because it's not in any way decorative despite the title. Um, this sort of inspired me quite a lot, really. So what I was going to show you were things that were kind of, in a way, at least to me, directly influenced by that, which in the sense of them being interventionist, I guess. So uh, I was in the graphic design building in Hull. Our, our college was like two miles away from the fine art faculty. Um, can we just flick? And I'll leave that. Uh, sorry, back again. Um, and this, yeah, sorry, this, no, sorry, but <laughs> leave it. The, the, this space was the fine artist's foyer. This, these doors were used as a kind of information notice board by the fine artists. Um, they advertised gigs or one-man shows or removal van services or whatever. And I went there one morning and I tore down all these homemade posters that they'd made and stuck up these posters, which if we could just go back again. Well, supposedly from the college authorities, you see the Humber University of Humberside logo in the bottom. And these posters, as you can see, they said, no posters allowed on these doors, and this is not a poster at the bottom. So, can we go to the next one? Um, the fine artists, no, sorry, I think, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. The fine artists are outraged by me doing this, because they thought the college authorities had got very heavy and, 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 and fascist with them, and, and interfered with their space. So they had a kind of emergency meeting in the, in the canteen, and they tore down these posters in act of revolt. So I went back the next morning, if you put these next, and put these posters up, which says, for the attention of all students, no information allowed in these doors. This is not student information. And these posters stayed up for a week. I think, I think they, were, they were so perplexed by this poster that uh, the students didn't bother with that one. Did you present that, Scott? Oh, got even better, wow. You get a real one. Oh. <laughs> Moving into my lemmy now. Um, is, it, is it on? 
Yeah. Uh, so I'm showing you this work really because it's because uh, of the because the interventionist nature of it. For me, when I'd done this, it was I don't know if I dare say epiphany, but it was a really a breakthrough for me because I. It's very hard to explain 20 years later, but uh, with graphic design, because I was never interested in the kind of decorative nature or the or, the, or really the, in many ways the purpose of it. For me, having realised that this relationship that I'm still fascinated by between the subject, the medium, and the context, the context in which the work is presented, then you could find an audience and then you could have an effect. This was the first thing I actually did where I realised that what I was doing was communicating and, and I had the power to actually communicate what I wanted to do rather than you know, use a, a comp a, an early Macintosh to, make, to redesign baked bean packaging or whatever, whatever graphic designers are doing. Um, next. And so from there I made this poster which I was sort of heavily influenced as a, as a young man by Guy Debord and the situation, and situationist ideas. And the, the, if you don't know, the essence of the society, the spectacle, the book, is about the fact that under capitalism, or Western capitalism, we don't actually do anything, we only spectate. And I sort of read this book and half understood it, but I, I, as ever I took the title and, and, and the kind of easy bit. And so I made these posters, which were, which I made, I made about 30 of these posters and I posted them around Hull. And I basically chose a, a, a family's name from a telephone directory. And I advertised this family's house as a site for a performance for two weeks in, in summer of 1992. And it came from the fact that when I was walking home every night and all the streets were very long and very straight and by 6 p.m. you could just see all these families watching television. So I advertised their house as a site-specific thing to invite other people to go and stand in their front garden and watch them watching television. Hence the spectacle of the Society of the Spectacle. Thanks. And uh, after I left college in, in uh, I think July 92, I moved down to London and I was on the dole. And this is kind of early days of celebrity magazines, I think, or that kind of culture now that is all encompassing. I don't know if you have it in the US, but in, 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 certainly in the UK, a magazine called Hello, which is a kind of hideous, cloying um, thing, a vehicle for uh, footballers' weddings and people, you know, it's a huge selling, million selling magazine or whatever it is. And I anticipate, in, in November 92, I, um, Windsor Castle, the Queen's favourite home, as it says there, uh, burnt down, and I anticipated that Hello magazine would cover it. And they did. They did. Could just keep going. They did a 16-page special on the burning Windsor Castle and the Queen. And again, uh, looking very. Well, she didn't look very upset there. Actually, she looks quite. I don't know, quite pleased. Maybe it was an insurance job. I don't know. Um, next. Anyway, next. So from so from that from that, I decided to try and sort of make a work about that. And I made this package, which is a match stuck to a piece of sandpaper, with a letter from the hello editor with a direct line number. And so this package, theoretically at least, was going to be attached to Hello magazine. And it was basically her encouraging readers to burn, burn down a local stately home and then ring her so they, so they could feature their uh, preferred blaze in the next issue of Hello magazine. And because I was, obviously I couldn't do all the copies of Hello magazine, I was on the door and everything, so I only made like 12 of these packages. I had to kind of sort of, what I was initially going to do was just stick them in some news agents around London and hope that something happened. But I kind of had a bit of a breakthrough thought, really. I thought if I posted these to friends around, all around the country, Northern Ireland, Scotland, uh, Yorkshire, everywhere, and I got them to send this package back to the editor of Hello! magazine, Maggie Goodman, saying they were outraged by Hello's anarchic behaviour and they were very disappointed in their favourite celebrity magazine, then they might get something, something might happen. So next one. Next. next. And they all received this letter back, which was... Um, Maggie Furious, um, offering her apologies and claiming that, and rightly claiming that hello had nothing to do with this kind of hideous um, attack. Next. I don't know, and then I don't know how this happened, but from there I became the designer initially at ID Magazine. So I went from kind of making work about magazines and about the context of things into actually becoming, eventually within a year or two, the art director of ID Magazine, where I learned to stick down pictures of Kate Moss very well. Um, I was there for three years, but it was never really what I wanted to do. It was something I, I almost saw it like an apprenticeship where I actually learned how to do I learned a skill, really. But I was very unhappy then. And so from there, I went on to do this self-published magazine called Crash, which I did with a friend of mine who's a historian called Matthew Worley. And we made this kind of fold-out magazine that was, I think, only a 1,000 copies of each. 
and the opposite to a magazine. It was dedicated to a single subject. This, the first issue is called Death to the New, which meant death to the new lad, which was a kind of huge cultural thing in, the, in 1997 in Britain, where I, I think led by bands like Blur and Oasis, this kind of sort of willfully moronic, often kind of middle-class graduate uh, who read the Loaded magazine adopted a kind of pretend football hooligan stance. And this was really against that, and um, against the idea. Can we just go next one? The reverse of that was a football pitch, and football, or soccer as you might say. Well, actually we'd say football, we're all English here. Um, <laughs> uh, we made this diagram, which was basically our heroes in a game of football versus the heroes of the new lad. So these kind of awful new lad comedians like Frank Skinner and David Baddiel versus the macho might of uh, Oscar Wilde and Andre Breton, Sean Ryder and Ian Curtis, of course, and other well-known footballers. Um, so just going back to again this idea of, the, of, the in, of intervening in the media, we, the second issue of Crash, we realised that, you know, although we'd, we'd sort of got publicity and peop some people seemed to talk about it, and it was even written about in national newspapers, we weren't reaching the audience we wanted, and we weren't getting enough of an audience. So we put the, similarly to the hello, but with permission, we put the, we made I think 5,000 copies of the, this, this issue, the next, so can you, the, this issue called Britstop, and we put it in Days and Confused magazine with Rankin's permission. So that was like, the per, in a way that was perfect but for us, and going back to the Dan Graham figurative in a way, that we were kind of offering a critique of the carrier or the vehicle that we were using to actually um, get our message across. Uh, biting the hand that feeds you, as someone might have said. We did a show at the ICA, which kind of was the end of Crash. It was a very bad show, actually. It was crap. But it did allow us to uh, get out another magazine, which was called Prada Minoff, which, if you don't know, the, the Prada Minoff were with German terrorists from the 70s, and we invented this phrase called Prada Minoff, which was about radical chic, and it was like a critique of the idea of once meaningful imagery and gestures uh, being used to sell T-shirts and things, and fashion, and vodka, etc. It's quite strange, actually, because within six months of this coming out, you could actually buy underpants in Berlin with Prada Meinhof written on them. So in a way, it's kind of, it went fully circular, this idea that we'd made a, a kind of critique of um, radical chic. And then, actually, in the fatherland, in the home of the Prada Meinhof, uh, they were selling our idea to sell under, using our idea to sell underpants. So it's, to me, that was quite fantastic. Uh, to Matt, who believes more, <laughs> in things. It was quite disappointing, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, the, as I said, the ICA show wasn't great, but the, the, it, it did, in a way it was good for us because it was, a, uh, because of the media aspect. It allowed us to buy space in magazine, in style magazines, again, like Days of Confused and The Face and things like that, and really uh, just use the space. So we had this blank space, we could do what we wanted. So we made these adverts. Uh, to emphasize the show. This is a Molotov cocktail made from an absolute vodka bottle and a Lillette. So this was banned, this one. This wasn't allowed. I think it's a, some kind of Chanel perfume jammed up the photographer's friend's backside. And, of and the, also the show allowed us to do this, which was uh, a, a, um, a billboard on the West Way. So really, in a way, the show was a, pretty much a disaster, but the, the things around it were really, for me at least, very successful. They allowed us to find a way of getting a message across in the media again, which is something I've always tried to do. Next. This relates back again. This is actually the first artwork I ever made, I think, really. Uh, uh, certainly the first one that was shown in a good gallery. It's for um, a show, a group show, Robert Prime, which became Magnani, more or less. And this is a combination of two things. It, it's... Uh, the, 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 on the left is the image, uh, images by Ellen von Umworth of Eva Herzegova, a fashion shoot from ID which was the very last thing I did before I was sacked or before I resigned, I'd never know quite what happened. Um, so really this fashion thing, I was laying out on my desk when I had a huge argument with the boss and I, I walked out. So, and that's combined with my sort of diary texts of the time, which is basically me sitting in pub feeling, so, pubs feeling sorry for myself. So it's, the, the combination of the two was supposed to be about the kind of spectacular version of Media London and the reality for people like me who were kind of sticking down photocopies of beautiful women. It was, kind of, it was about the gap, really, the void between you know, the media, media image and expectation and the reality of being badly paid and being miserable. So I, I, I was going to lie to you about this. I was going to say it was actually 
I always intended it to go back into a magazine, but I didn't. It really was a gallery work, and I think in a way it works best as a gallery work. I won't read you all the text. You, you can imagine what they're like. <laughs> Somehow from, I mean, then the combination of actually me, I mean, being the art director ID and then doing this thing crash led me to be involved with this smaller magazine called Sleaze Nation, which is a magazine I actually really hated, I think. And uh, I kind of had it in my mind that the best thing I could do for society was to get it taken off the shelves. So I kind of kept coming up with these cover ideas uh, that were not at all ironic. So, for example, I wrote this. It absolutely meant it, but um, it ended up turning out to be an, an award-winning cover that sold the most they'd ever sold. So it's quite, again, like the Pride of Mind off thing, it's quite funny with the media. Certainly the aspects of the media I've been involved in, which is the kind of very superficial style end. Almost anything you give to them, if it seems offensive or risque in any way, it becomes incredibly successful. It's quite bizarre. This, again, is about context. And, again, and I think, in a way, this is another kind of interventionist thing, really, because it was all about the context. This came out um, just after 9-11, and I think everybody who published anything just after 9-11 felt that the next issue... I'd prove myself wrong by, if you look around the magazines, actually, but I felt that everybody was going to have to comment on 9-11, and we were, I was trying to think, how could I say anything about that in a style magazine? And we couldn't, really, but I, what I thought I'd try and comment on it instead was the sort of superficial idiocy and, and, and bombastic nature of how other people would comment on it. Um, that's that. But by art directing the magazine, again, it, it kind of allowed me to go full circle, where I, because I had control of the magazine, more or less. I could kind of use it as a vehicle to make my own artworks. And this was uh, a piece called Ep Epidemic, a fashion story, as you can see. And what it was, was uh, pictures of English football hooligans, England football hooligans, often abroad, um, that I took, you know, press images, and I turned into a fashion story. So the credits at the bottom there read, like, uh, left to right, scuffling England fan, wears trainers by Adidas, jeans by Lee, and jacket by Barracuda. So everything is recredited as a fashion story. And then on the right there, for, well, this, on the left it says, wet England fan wears t-shirt by Daily, Mir uh, Daily Mirror. On the right, a missile threat England fan wears shirt by Aquascutum. Bleeding England fan wears shirt by Lacoste. Chanting England fans left to right wear hat by The Sun, shirt by Daily Mirror, uh, shorts by Burberry. A chair throwing England fan wears replica Accrington Stanley t-shirt. Uh, Accrington Stanley football shirt, shorts by Next. Trainers, Stan Smith by Adidas. Um, this was a piece of work I made for a show, PS1, uh, for a show created by Neville Wakefield. And it's called How I'd Sink American Vogue. So again, it was about me kind of fantasizing and theorizing about the media. And really, I suppose in a way that the, the, the idea of me being able to sink American Vogue was such a kind of grand fantasy. You know, the idea of me replacing Anna Winter is so fantastical. I was quite excited by the idea, and I sort of started looking at American Vogue, just as this kind of vehicle for you know, utter conservativeness and pomposity and, and, and wrongness, I guess, in a way. And you know, I noticed aspects of it, for, for, for whatever reason, almost every cover mentions cancer, for example, which is obviously a big seller. I don't know why. And everything is all about numbers, so they have huge numbers. It's like 769... Uh, um, uh, haircuts or whatever it is. So it actually doesn't say something. They always say it's 83, but I exaggerated somewhat. So this one is the angry issue. And this is and it contains, sev contains 769 things that make Scarlet You're fucking right. useless. <laughs> <laughs> All he's talks about money is I'm, gonna, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do the I'm control. Going to do I'm going to do that. <laughs> and so this, again, just after um, you know, the horror of what happened in New Orleans, they, of course the American vote felt they have to comment on that. So really, I, I, this is my first issue as the editor, art director, publisher of American Vogue, where I've got total control. And I start off quite mellow, I think, in a way. I'm obviously quite egotistical, you can see that, and I'm quite maybe p particular in what I want to talk about, uh, like the Black Panthers, which I don't think they talk about that much in American Vogue. And as things go on, I get more out of control because I'm, I'm in New York in my kind of huge penthouse apartment doing more and more cocaine and drinking all day, and I get more and more out of control. So. This is a kind of combination of, gun, of Guns and Ammo magazine and American Vogue. And I think it mentions cancer, of course. Yeah, can you turn back the clock on bowel cancer? Which I don't think was a real American Vogue line, but it's not dissimilar. But how yoga can change your body and your whole life, that's definitely from American Vogue. Um, next one. 
this is trying to, trying to show a little bit of social concern because you know I've got a, even though I'm off my head on drugs and booze, I've got um, a, a conscience. And I would speak to Karl Lagerfeld about cancers. And the Alicia Keys thing is actually a line from American Vogue. Next one. This is a free giveaway. You get one shoe, a plastic court shoe, free for every reader. This was not a big seller, surprising thing in this one. I, I thought this would be a real sellout, but it didn't, didn't really work. So by this time, this, so what I didn't say to you, I should say, these are, kind of, these are over a period of a year. So this is, by now, I think we're into September. And I'm just, you know, I'm kind of losing my mind, really. It might sort of like Scarface as the editor of American Vogue. I'm, I'm going nuts by, in, in, in this sort of horrible, decadent lifestyle that I'm leading. And then next. Finally, we kind of end on, you know, where I've, I've totally lost my mind. And uh, this is the final issue before the magazine actually sinks and I've managed to sink American Vogue. Finally, this is just another intervention which I'm showing you. This was on a site outside Tate Modern. And I was commissioned by the Architecture Foundation in London to do something on this hoarding. And I'd been in Munich a lot, as I did a show there. And everything in Munich was incredible, really. There are these beautiful grand buildings, and every one of them was being cleaned. So they were covered in this, in, in a one-to-one -one scale representation of their own facade. So with this, I just tried to kind of tell the truth about what it was. And that's what I try and do, tell the truth. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So be you prepared another lecture when we discussed, which will be a silent lecture. Yeah, which we have, have next I'm happy you didn't, but we will run it now um, on the wall when we talk. Uh, can you explain why you call it a silent lecture and how it functions? Because it includes a lot of your new work with these quotes and these series of texts that you make. Well, in a way, if I was really honest, I have to be honest now, Saddam. Um, in a way, it's a vehicle for, for, the, for these quotes. But also, it's an old idea, it was an old crash idea, actually, where we did a thing called Aburbia, which was a kind of our interpretation of, of a, a inner London suburbia, this idea that these people came from the home counties and worked in media London and just recreated this kind of hideous uh, monoculture for themselves, which we called Aburbia as opposed to suburbia. So it's an urban suburbia. This one is more vague. It's purely about the idea of a silence lecture. In a way, I was thinking maybe I could show this and have to speak, <laughs> and then I'd be much happier. <laughs> so. Um, it's a, I don't know, I, I think in a way, without being pompous about it, it's, it's it, I guess, you know, if anybody who's looking at this has got their own lecture going in their mind, you know, if, you, if you associate the images or associate them to the quotes, then your interpretation is going to be different to the next person's. So I was quite interested in that aspect of it as well. And how did you, how did you organize the montage for this one? Because there's, there's a lot of, can you hear me? Okay. Because there's a lot of uh, new concern in your work, like I mean, I mean, in a way that there are these figures from history and, and culture and art, even because there's a lot of Anish Kapoor in the last quote that uh, you raise as I don't know, like well, possible it's, 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 new it's, targets for you. Oh, somehow. new targets, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just about really, I think the, the the insanity of that really, the state of Britain, the state of the economy, and the state of my bank account. And then the, the idea that then Anish Kapoor and his pals are making these kind of increasingly monstrously sized sculptures, and worse, they're making them in the, you know, the most depressed areas of Britain, uh, which we kind of come to, I think, in a minute. Uh, it's just about the insanity of that, really, which is, which is the comparison with Hitler and, Hitler and his Germania ambition, you know. Mm -hmm. And you made your own version of a monumental sculpture that you proposed oh, yeah. for. Yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a pylon made out of matchsticks. We're supposed to be. Oh, we should finish. Yeah, kind of. I think oh, we have two okay. minutes. Well, if, if but we, if, we brought Scott new book. If you want to have a look at the book and get him signed this book, which is his first monograph. I think there's a second little book that maybe you want to say something about that is more an artist publication, uh, the anxiety and depression. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, anxiety and depression is like a fake. It's like a fake self-help book, really, um, about too much about drinking too much so it's just kind of and in a way that's also a vehicle for short stories and ideas that they're bound together by this idea you know this this idea of helping oneself by reading a pamphlet and somehow you'll be cured so that's what that one's about thank you scott thank you <laughs> thank you for coming <laughs>